Well, good morning, everybody. Uh, it is the 29th of December, and um, just a few days left in, in 2020. What a, what a charmer of a year this has been. Um, today's topic is the end of academia, and it's kind of ironic, really, I think, that the beginning of the end of this progressive left-wing totalitarian nightmare uh, which started in academia has its best chance to end in the end of academia. So let's just back up a little bit, shall we? If, if you wanted to put a pin on when everything in this country started to go to hell completely, uh, if there was one point there domestically, I would say it was, I'm almost positive it was in 1964, might have been 66, but it was relatively early. And there was a, um, a number of radical students, I think it was at Yale University, and they decided they had a problem with something, so they took over the Yale Law School Library. And instead of basically calling campus security or the police force and throwing them out and expelling them all, the, uh, the faculty said, well, we, we definitely want to hear your concerns if you feel strongly enough about it to barricade yourself into the uh, library. then." We want to be down with whatever it is you're um, so terribly upset about. And, and that was the beginning of, of the end. That was the beginning of academia basically becoming a place where students become more and more like the kind of child soldiers you find in Africa. Uh, ruthless, cold-blooded, uh, fanatical. Um, one of the things that all uh, despots and despotic um, regimes and ideas understand in their bones is that you've got to get to, to kids early and you've got to and you got to stay on them they're easy to mold in fact that's that's the entire purpose of childhood is to be malleable is to believe that you can hide underneath the cushions of a couch or or that the evidence of um, of Santa Claus consists of, of uh, a couple of eaten cookies and a half drunk uh, glass of milk and that's conclusive when you're that age you put ideas into somebody's head at that age, and um, it's virtually impossible to get them out. It's not impossible, but it's that's the age. And if a lot of them have to die because they're so um, impetuous or poorly trained or whatever, small price for you to pay because, as far as you're concerned, they're all just disposable units to get you to the political power you want to get to. So that's how I look at these um, at these at the majority of these kids in college today. Now I'm always I'm always generalizing. You kind of have to do that when you talk about large scale societal events, but uh, as a generalization, um, it's not a terribly bad one. Uh, the, the college campus has become, I'm sorry, it's not that I have a call or anything, I just sometimes just like to leave myself um, open to, uh, in case somebody has to reach me in an emergency, and tell me the sound's not working. Um, the, um, this this really became evident in the 60s, obviously, when the counterculture started sweeping through campus, the Vietnam War protests and so on. I was in school between 79 and 82 at the University of Florida, which was not exactly a hotbed of radicalism at the time. But even then, you could begin to see the edges of it. I, I took a class in, in feminism because there was nothing else left. It was just the only thing out there for me to get um, credits that I needed for that particular uh, semester. And even then, they were starting with this kind of, you can't possibly know anything about this, or you're a fascist, or you're a this, or you're a sh chauvinist was a term that was common back in those days. Um, and it's gotten nothing but worse and worse and worse and worse and worse. So now college is a place where you go in order to not learn anything. It's a place to go to be protected from new ideas. It's a place to go to have all of your pre-existing biases confirmed. It's the precise opposite of what it used to be. It's the precise opposite of what it should be. And I came to this topic today by reading yet another of the endless series of articles that are put out by campus reform. In this particular case, a college professor at the University of Central Florida, I believe, um, described the, um, the Wuhan uh, virus as the Wuhan virus. And that caused one person, and we talked about this many times, one person 
decided, here's my opportunity to show everybody how virtuous I am because I can't do anything else. I'm not allowed to compete. I'm not allowed to excel. I'm not, you know, no, I can't do anything except for show everybody that I can protest better and, and, and be more virtuous than anyone else. So this one student basically started this one person campaign and utterly um, swamped the school with demands that this racist professor uh, be removed for calling the Wuhan virus the Wuhan virus. He has to be removed, has to be canceled, and, and, and they will do it too. Hasn't happened yet, but they will, because they're nothing but miserable cowards, all of them. Almost called today's episode Married to the Mob because it's the same thing. It is not the agitators that are responsible for this decline. There have always been agitators, and there have always been children, by the way. It's always been children who have childish beliefs and childish demands and temper tantrums, and they stamp their feet, and they go down on the floor, and they cry until they get the toy. That's been with us forever. But there has never been a, a, such a whole-scale collapse of spine on the part of institutions the way there has been among universities, and it started in the universities, and everything downstream from there followed suit. So you get these kids that have never been denied anything as children. They go in whenever they don't get what they want. They have a temper tantrum, and they, they, uh, they start smashing things. Parents say, we got to get them on Ritalin. Well, maybe you should spend some time with them. Maybe you should give them some boundaries, because that's what they're looking for. But now that's, that's a little too time consuming. So they get into high school and they start making demands there and they start, they start realizing that this is social prestige that they're not allowed to get in any other way. They get to college. Then their basic college, their entire college education consists of searching around, not too far because you don't want to go to some place like, oh, I don't know, Saudi Arabia where there's actual slavery or, or things of that nature, but just, you know, on campus. They start sniffing around to find the most um, the most outrageous thing they can find, and usually it's not terribly outrageous. And in this particular case that launched this particular tirade, it's a professor calling the, the virus that originated from Wuhan uh, the Wuhan virus. So this guy will undoubtedly be forced to leave his position because the university will not stand up to any kind of criticism the second that they raise the, the, the word, the R word, you know, oh, he's racist, it's racist to say that, they're gonna back down. And because they back down, what has happened is now that on our nation's campuses, not just universities now, but high schools and even, even primary schools, what's happened now is that, is that the, the students are in charge and it, is the, and it is the teachers and the professors that are terrified and in a state of constant fear about the discipline that may be enforced upon them by these children. And there is nothing more terrifying than a seven or eight or a 10 year old holding the gun. Nothing more terrifying than that. That's it. If you had a seven year old in the corner or something who was having a temper tantrum and he had a loaded pistol pointing at you, I would rather face anything I think other than that. That's where we are and that's where we put ourselves. So what do we do about it? Well, the internet giveth and the internet taketh away. And uh, all, of the, all of the pressure that is exerted on this particular teacher as one specific example of something that goes on hundreds of times every single day. He supported Trump, by the way, or at least questioned some of the things that were launched against Trump. That's what it was. He didn't support Trump, but some of the attacks made against Trump, he said, sometimes there's more to the story than that. that that's a definite sign that this racist has to go before he pollutes the minds of the, of the, um, of the woke um, mob. So. You've got this situation now where, where colleges are, are, are the hotbed of, of intellectual, intellectual, not intellectual freedom, not intellectual um, <clears throat> contact or intellectual stimulation or any of that stuff. This is the place, <clears throat> excuse me, where intellectual terror runs the deepest. And I've seen that many times in the colleges that I spoke to before I stopped doing colleges three years ago, four years ago. I won't speak at a college anymore. I won't speak at a college anymore because up until the last time I spoke at a college, the situation was so, it was so pre-biased, they were so preset in their opinions that you would have to take an hour just to warm them up to the point where they would actually listen to you. And you can do that, by the way. And what I found the last time I went to college was as I started to warm people up, and begin to have a conversation with them, then the people who were there to shout and chant 
what 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 more childish thing is there than 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 da 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 da, da. once that happened i began to realize okay this is this is this battlefield is lost the battle for education isn't lost but the battlefield is lost it's gone and the longer you stay here the more you're going to just get mopped up most of the most of the casualties you know in in at least in historical battles uh, ancient battles almost all of the major killing took place when one side broke and ran away it's easy to kill somebody when they're running away that's where the real massacres occurred um and so all right they they've taken over the colleges the university professors who started this whole thing really because that's where the whole the whole germ the whole infection started was in colleges by by radicalized students who had it's real simple we just walk it backwards you got the frankfurt school that's determined that you can no longer have the communist revolution through the workers uh, capitalism has made the situation too prosperous for them so they're never going to form the vanguard of the revolution which has to happen because otherwise you're going to continue to be a no account schmuck uh, so um, Frankfurt School uh, of Philosophers determined that the that the Marxist revolution would have to be brought about not through the workers or the economy, but through the dispossessed and the culture. And they found some radical students, and they managed to get them uh, further radicalized. And those students stayed in colleges and became radical professors, and they radicalized even more students. And then the next thing you know, the person who's the dean of the journalism school is no longer interested in reporting news. He's interested in reporting whatever news helps the cause of, 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 the, of the left's uh, political desires. And anybody who, who reports news that, that doesn't help or, 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 or worse, slows it down or, or reverses it, is chastised or fired. And in the same way that we saw uh, the Obama administration make the military unbelievably, almost unrecognizably politically correct, he didn't just fire the people he didn't go in, Obama didn't just cashier warriors. He's much more effective way to do that than that. What he did was he implemented policies throughout the military that made it intolerable for an honorable soldier or an honorable warrior to remain in the military, made it intolerable for them. And I, I, this I know from certain fact from having talked to, I don't know, by now it's scores of people, scores and scores of people. Uh, 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 Special Forces uh, commander who, who no longer is able to t take his troops out and train in the field. Now he has to search the barracks for uh, girly magazines or tattoos that um, transgendered people might find offensive. And uh, a lifelong um, petty officer uh, in the Navy who said that when he signed up, he understood that he was going to spend six months of his life uh, in, a, in a steel uh, box underneath the surface of the ocean, basically not in a submarine, he's just below decks in the engine room. And his consolation for this was something that quaintly used to be called liberty, which meant that every couple months he'd get to a foreign port, he'd sign off of the ship, he'd walk off, and then he had to be back on Monday morning at 9 a.m. whenever they were shipping out. And as long as that happened, he was on his own. He was at liberty, which meant he could be free. He told me years ago that those days are long gone. Now so sailors in foreign ports can only stay in, in Navy-approved uh, barracks regulations or hotels, and they can only go to Navy-approved things, and they have to check in so many other times, just like any other children. He said, it's just not worth it anymore. Just, it's just not fun. I'm not doing it. I don't, I'm not, I'm not re-enlisting. That's how you get people out of the military. And the same thing is exactly what happened with universities. You make it intolerable for people with differing opinions, or forget even a differing political opinion, you make it intolerable for, for educators who are committed to education to stay there. You make it intolerable for them. And it's basically what you do is you say, well, we're not gonna, you know, grade scores that go to high schools like LA Unified School District where there are thousands of teachers who are paid every day to not teach because there are disciplinary strikes against them, but the union makes sure that they don't get fired or anything like that. And so, and so if you have a teacher who's committed to teaching students, and, and that means finding out whether they're learning, and that means taking tests, if you have a teacher who who's ascribes to rigorous standards of measuring the success of what they're doing, then that person's called a racist, or whatever you have to call them, and, or her, in order to get them out of there. And then the pressure becomes so great 
that they either resign or they, or they retire early or they just plain walk out. Many times, instead of either of those options, they just shut up. That's what they do. And like, like many people, it's hard to blame them. They basically say, okay, I'll just keep my mouth shut. I got another seven years or I've got tenure or whatever. I'm just going to I'm just gonna uh, shut up and go along with all of this, and then I'm going to retire, and then I don't have to deal with this anymore. And this, these individual acts of, of well, they are in, ultimately they're individual acts of, of cowardice, but the overwhelming barrage is kind of like saying, you know, you, you see that uh, flag up over there? Yeah, well, and you see all those, those machine gun nests and barbed wire and artillery exploding and landmines and stuff? Yeah, well, I want you to go over there to get that flag. By myself? Yeah. Am I going to get any air support? Nope. What about artillery to soften up enemy positions? No, I just want you to walk across that field there and get that flag and bring it back. A person who declines to do that is declining to do that out of fear, but you can't really call those people cowards, can you? I mean, they're just, they're just plain suicide. And that's what's the situation now with our college campuses. Anybody stands up for principles, it's suicide. So either they leave or they shut up, one of those two. And as that happens, the situation becomes more and more toxic. You know, the way I like to think of this kind of effect is to imagine a lake bed out in the desert and it's rained and there's a fair amount of fresh water there. Okay, then it stops raining. And slowly the water evaporates. And as the water evaporates, the, the, the lake, get, the actual liquid part of the lake gets smaller and smaller and smaller and smaller and smaller. And more than that, it gets more and more salty, more and more toxic. As more of the water boils off, what's left becomes more and more and more toxic until finally all the water is gone and you've just got nothing but salt there where there used to be a lake with living things in it. So what do we do about this catastrophe? Well, first of all, um, I think this has been true for a while. And if you haven't figured this out yet, th it, it might be time for you to think about it seriously. For any of you that are paying uh, for children in college, you need to understand that the money that you've worked for and set aside your entire life in order to educate your children is now being spent in order to teach them to hate you and, and your family and your values and, and everything you did for them. Whatever money you think you may have saved to send them to college so that they can get an education is now money that is being spent in order to make your own children hate, despise, and loathe you, and, and, and if, not, if not never see you again, then pretty soon, as we're seeing already, turn you in for some information they may have on you. I never thought it would go this bad this fast, but this is what happens when you have termites down in the basement, right? When you don't check the foundations and you know there's something wrong down there, but you're too scared to go down and look, then things can collapse pretty fast. So what, what, what do you do about that? Well, we are, we are in a very, very interesting time where so much of the, I wouldn't have known about this story at the University of Central Florida that I mentioned today if it hadn't been for the internet. And the pressure on the faculty to remove this professor who called the Wuhan virus the Wuhan virus wouldn't be nearly as strong, in fact, be barely noticeable if it was one person writing a letter instead of one person with a Facebook page getting thousands or millions of views of whatever the case may be. So the internet takes away, and the internet is driven people crazy, and the internet magnifies the lever of, of social proof, and it's done enormous irreparable damage to society. But it also gives something back. Um, my wife is, uh, is a, a, a superb photographer, best photographer in the world as far as I'm concerned, and has recently taken up painting, which she also excels at to a scary degree. And I was and remain utterly astonished at, at the number of videos that are available for absolute free, teaching her everything she needs to know about any particular aspect of, of painting or anything else for that matter. The, the amount of information that's put up on, on YouTube for free, and this is information that's put up on YouTube for free by the people who pay for it, the paying members of BillWhittle.com or the people who make a one-time donation at BillWhittle.com. 
the amount of information that is out there that's available for free is astonishing and and it it varies quite a bit um, but the, the best of it is as good as anything out there what seems to be missing at least as I look at it, it are two things. First of all, there's an enormous amount of quality information on the internet, but that doesn't mean much if you don't know how to find it. That's kind of like for those of you who are old enough to remember what a library is. That's kind of like walking into a library and having all of the books in the library arranged randomly on the shelves, and there is no index cards. There is no way to find. I'm looking for uh, this book on geography. Well, it's one of the 80,000 books that are out there on the shelves. Good luck. And so one of the problems is, is structuring that resource in a way that people can, can get to it. Uh, education isn't, isn't just masses of information hurled at people. Uh, this may come as a surprise to some of you, um, but for those of you who've ever had a good teacher, you know it's not. Education is essentially a story that that has signposts and uh, or mileposts along the way and those mileposts are facts they're pieces of data and any decent education is a story that is told that walks you down this path and then points out where these pieces of data are to to cement in your mind the idea that what you're doing the path you're walking is is real there's some truth to it and so the first thing that, that is needed is a, is a reference card system. We need a Dewey Decimal system for, for the um, internet, largely on YouTube, but elsewhere as well. Many of the situations that we find ourselves in today and many of the solutions to those situations are things that I can sometimes point out or see or at least grope around the edges of, but I, I'm certainly not in a position to actually do this myself. It doesn't mean it can't be done. And in fact, the entire purpose of the show is to put ideas out there so that people can start acting on them. But if you think about it, one thing that would be really useful would be a, an index card system for the Internet. One of the things that you hear young people today say when you, when you challenge them that they don't know anything, they don't know who landed on the moon first or what year. They don't know who was on what side in World War II, and they don't know what year World War II happened. Many of them don't know if the Civil War occurred before the Revolutionary War, and we can do this all day. The majority of students in this country, if you gave them a globe with no mapping on it at all, no, no numbers, they, they, they couldn't even find their own country. That's how bad things have gotten here, and, and it's actually worse than that. College professors and high school teachers as well are constantly, constantly block quoting segments of students' papers, searching it against the internet and finding that all they do is, is, is copy and paste from stuff they find on the internet. They have learned absolutely nothing except how to copy and paste. So we've got a serious situation where even, see, the, the traditional kind of um, kind of hidebound solution to this would be to say what we need is a series of educational videos uh, like a homeschooling uh, set and and that's a fine idea and I happen to have been a part of a couple of those and have a third one coming out soon I did uh, Apollo 11 what we saw which was about the space race four parts on the space race and and then we did the Cold War which was 13 parts on the Cold War and if you watch all of those or listen to them in sequence you have a pretty good idea what happened I'm, I'm really proud of that work but there is so much content out there right now that is uncoordinated. It's not in sequence. It's not, it's not structured in any way. It is just part of the information soup, like a soup of nutrients that are out there. Sometimes the best way to think of the Internet is to think of it as just a sort of primordial soup of proteins and amino acids and stuff. And you need to build a molecule. And so what you really need to do is you need to go out there and find to take this and attach it to here, and I'll take it attach it to there, and do it. I create this thing, I got it, great. And once I'm done with it, the parts just dissolve back out into the soup, and then you assemble something new out of it. So one of the things that, that I don't hear anybody talking about, I do hear people talking about homeschooling um, or, 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 or educational curricula, and I think these are the best way to go, don't get me wrong. But there's, they're few and far between. The funding for these is difficult to obtain, and, and, and also 
just finding them is relatively difficult to obtain, although the homeschool movement grows every day and has got certainly got some resources behind it. But what would be extremely useful would be to have a series of index cards, and the, and the lines I'm thinking along are something like this, something like this. Uh, a person who has a degree in astronomy basically finds a number of existing videos that are out there and basically just puts together a playlist. And they basically say, here is your Astronomy 101 playlist. And you start with whatever videos there may be on the formation of the Earth and so on and so forth and how the moon was created, blah, blah, blah. And you work your way up and so on. Because the, again, I know I've said this several times, but it needs to be said. If, we think, if we're thinking about creating educational materials and putting them out there, that's a lot of work. But the point I'm trying to make is not only is that work not necessary, it's already been done and, and done at a very, very high quality, very high quality. The best instructional videos on the internet are the best educational materials I've ever seen. And I do nothing but look at either videos on the internet or read articles. All of the information that I've got at my disposal and have had since I've been doing this has come from the internet. But here's the, here's the problem. If you ask young people, about why they don't know anything and they can't tell you what, who was on what side in World War II. What they'll say is almost invariably and very quickly too is, well, I don't need to know that because I can just Google it. If I need to know it, I'll just Google it. And what they don't understand is it's not a question of them not knowing what the answers are. It's a question of them not knowing what question to ask. That's the problem. The problem isn't that they can get any information they want. Anybody can get any information they want today, get it instantly. The problem is they don't know what questions to ask. Yes, they could find out what happened in the, uh, in the, um, the Tunisia campaign and Operation Torch. Yes, they could have, a, uh, they could have an extraordinarily good series of, of articles and videos telling them exactly, with pictures and all kinds of historical references, exactly what happened with Operation Torch when the United States first got into the war in, in Northern Africa and Tunisia and all the rest of it, but they don't know how to ask the question because they don't have any idea what Operation Torch is. They don't, they've heard of World War II, maybe. Some of them haven't nowadays. And they don't have the slightest idea of how to, how to access that information because it's not a question of them being able to get the answers. They don't have the questions. So, as in the case of astronomy, if, if, a, if a person who really understood astronomy and an astronomy educator were simply to say, here is a good Astronomy 101 playlist, and we add videos as they come up and replace older ones, and, and if videos are taken offline for whatever reason, we, we just adjust it. And here's a very good World War II playlist, and the playlist could be broken down into other playlists and all the rest of it. This is one way of solving the education problem. And, and it is the only way I see out of the situation we're in because the, the, the university system first, then the high schools and now elementary schools have become indoctrination centers. They're no longer about education at all. They're, about, they're not about teaching information or, or teaching you how to think. They're about giving you information a specific flavor of information and teaching you specifically how not to think. That's what universities and colleges and schools do now. They teach you how not to think and they teach you how to protect yourself against differing viewpoints. It doesn't have to be that way, but I do think brick and mortar universities are done. I don't think there's any saving them. So my personal opinion, I'd love to be wrong about that. But I think they're finished and I think they've done it to themselves and, and I don't see any way to recover. A Harvard degree used to mean something. Now it just means that you're a rich person who knows how to stamp your feet and have a temper tantrum. The second thing is, is a little tougher, at least it seems to me to be a little tougher. And that is, what do you do to replace the socialization aspects of school and um, colleges? Now, you say something like this, and immediately uh, many homeschoolers will just just leap at your throat and say, my child has, is as socialized as anybody else in, in, in a public school or university or whatever. And, I, and I, I'm not really doubting that. But I am telling you, as a person who, who went to college, there's a lot about college that has nothing to do with education that's really important at that age. And yes, a lot of it's uh, fooling around and drinking and taking crazy risks and going to football games and stuff, but that's important. 
I don't know how to replace that uh, off the top of my head. I really don't. If you were to ask me about what, if, if the university system as we understand it were going away, and it is, because it's not doing what it was designed to do. It's just not. It's going to go the same way as, as whalebone corset manufacturers and people who manufacture wagon wheels. It's done. It's over. There is no education to be had there now. It continues to get worse, and it is now the place to go to send your kids to, to, to learn how not to think and how to hate you. That's what they've done to themselves. They deserve it. But I don't know what to do about, about missing that feeling in a, in a fall afternoon when the air's starting to get a little crisp and just marching down into a big stadium full of people and we're all wearing the same colors and the band is playing and we get in there and we're cheering and we're smuggled in our grain alcohol or whatever the case may be and, and, and I don't know what to do about replacing that. I don't know what to do about replacing the entire aspect of becoming an adult that starts to happen in many cases in colleges. But, but, you know, the, the, the people that don't go to college seem to be doing, don't, they not only seem to be doing just fine, they're clearly doing better than those that do. Those kids that are going to trade schools and not coming out of college with a $300,000 debt, and in addition to that, having a useful skill and all the rest of it, seem to be much happier people. But I do miss, if you were to ask me what I would miss about the demise of universities, if universities were just to disappear, and I genuinely believe that's what's going to happen and is happening now, then the part that would make me sad wouldn't be the things that I learned in the classroom, although I learned some very good things in the classroom. Most of what I've learned, I've learned on the internet. What I would miss is I would miss I'd miss football games, and I would miss, um, and I would miss going to the Ratskeller after classes, and I would miss, um, you know, uh, little concerts, and I would miss, um, I'd miss being in the theater department, and not only would I miss doing the performance there, but I'd miss going to the Windjammer, which is long gone in Gainesville, Florida, and sitting there with students and professors till closing time, and um, and and having my one meal of the day, which was a Windjammer special, which was essentially two pieces of white bread with some ham and turkey overlaid and then some yellow mystery sauce poured over it. I, I, I survived on those things. And the conversations after school with professors, the conversations with, uh, with students after hours um, in whatever your chosen field, those things are very, very, very important, very valuable. And they're, I think they're much harder to do, much harder to do than the replacing the education aspect of academia. Um, I don't have the answer to that, but you know what the nice thing about that is? I don't have to have all the answers. But I don't have to have any of the answers, to be perfectly honest with you. All I have to do is we head into these very uncertain changes and, and difficult times and, and darkness and all the rest of it because this college mob is terrifying. It's terrifying to watch. It's as terrifying as the as the um, the Red Guards or the Hitler Youth or or whatever. There's nothing more scary than a fanatical young person who has no idea about what's going on and is 100% certain that they're right and is ready to kill anybody gets in their way. And that's what we're seeing now. So I don't know what to do about that, but I don't have to. And and this is the beautiful thing about the internet. And this is ultimately what the internet gives us back in exchange for the appalling price that it charges us in terms of the damage done by social media and all the rest. More than the access to information, what the, what the internet does is it gives us access to imagination. And that's something nobody really thinks about. It's no longer, and really never has been, about access to information. It's access to imagination, and it's also access to a word that is horribly butchered by um, corporate shills and people who are pretending to be good at what they do. And that overused, overhyped word, there's just nothing else for it, and, and that is synergy. The internet allows people to use their own imaginations and use their imaginations in their own area of expertise and put it into a pot someplace. And then as other people do the same thing, something assembles itself. I've seen it many times. It's a miracle, really. 
It really is. It's a miracle. But the problem is in front of us. The tools to solve the problem are in front of us. The structure on how to solve this problem is not apparent yet. But if you have ideas about this, and this is something you're thinking is interesting, then if you use your imagination and connect your imagination to other people's imagination, then structures will arise and, they'll, and, and they will immediately mutate into their most efficient forms because people will constantly be saying things like, that's a great idea, uh, it might be better if we try it this way, and if, it, if it's better, it works, if it doesn't, it doesn't. So, you know, there's a lot to lament about, about the loss of brick and mortar universities. But I'm sure there was a lot to lament about the loss of the horse as well and, 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 and the loss of, um, of, of sailing ships and all the rest of it. I'm sure that there were always people who said, we're really missing out on something, not having those giant billowing canvases up above us. And yes, we get across the ocean much faster now in this steamship, but we're really giving up something important. And the, we never experience it, so we have no way to know. In any event, I, I really don't see any way around it. Um, the universities uh, are not going to be recovered. Uh, I'm not telling you that's an absolute fact. I'm just telling you that I'm convinced it is. And so we know the power of education. We know the value of education. We have an ocean of information out there. And we have large numbers of people. And this is the final piece of the puzzle. And that is America's greatest resource is its retired people. Everybody says its greatest, oh, your greatest resource is your children. No. No, 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 no. They're the greatest potential, and they, are, and they are the things that the resources need to be applied to. But if you don't apply any education or any structure or civilization to children, then they're just feral animals who will destroy anything that, that you've built. Now, it's retired people that are the great resource of this nation because they have real-world skills, and they, and they have real-world experience, and they've got 50 years of it. And it is to the retired people that we're going to have to look to, to to put in the pieces of, of structure that come from their imagination and their experience and their wisdom to help create a set of, of constantly evolving questions, series of questions that can be answered by the collective wisdom and intelligence of the human species, which is available now on the internet, if you know where to look. Anyway, that'll do it for, uh, for today's program, The End of Academia. Um, if this made sense to you, and um, hopefully it did, we need your help. All of these things are going away. Something's going to have to replace them. We're trying to find the answers here. And um, the more resources we have to do that, the, the, the more people we can reach with the message. So um, we would urge you again, if you, if you think that the world that we've gotten ourselves into is going to change back to what we want uh, without effort or resources or, or change on your part, well, it's not going to happen. So you either watch it get worse or you can help it get better. Those are your choices. And um, if you don't help me, help somebody. So uh, that'll do it for this edition of Moving Back to America. Uh, I'm Bill Whittle, and we will see you here tomorrow. And you all be careful out there, and we'll see you soon.